Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining the SOAS webinar series. I'm sorry, but my video isn't quite working. I think there's something wrong with the settings, so hopefully that's okay. Um, I hope you're all able to safely enjoy the weather. Um, this series is a joint series organized by SOAS Economics Department and the Open Economics Forum. Um, today we are joined by Arjun Chang, um, who I'm sure needs no introduction. Um, his topic today is how to build a new society after the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but before we begin, um, can I please mention that you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I have put the links in the chat. So that's Facebook, SOAS Economics and Open Economics Forum, same for Twitter. And you can also check out our previous events. They are all recorded in the link in the chat over there. Um, you can also tweet about the event using hashtag economics of COVID. And um, for the structure of the talk, um, Harjin will be talking for around 30 minutes, after which we'll have another half an hour of a Q&A session. Um, we will be collecting questions throughout the talk. So if you do have questions, please just post them in the chat and we will collate them. And then once the talk is done during the Q&A session, we will start asking them as well. Um, unless there are anything else, I think, Arjun Chang, if you're ready, you can begin. Hi, thank you, Yong. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, really grateful for you guys uh, to come to listen to me on this very nice day when you could be spending uh, time outside. Uh, we have all been through this pandemic, I mean, obviously, different people have different conditions in terms of uh, living arrangements and so on. So, I mean, uh, I have been relatively comfortable, but it's been a strain for many people. And I think, yeah, this is a crisis that is very difficult to come to terms with, because it's even like preventing us from doing things that make us human, you know, I mean, being with other people, meeting new people, you know, and even just being in a crowd, you know, I grew up in Seoul, South Korea, one of the mega cities of the world. And I, I just uh, sometimes need to be in the crowd and we cannot do that. But, you know, apart from these aspects, the devastation that uh, this pandemic has uh, wreaked uh, on the economy is mind-boggling. The IMF earlier in April predicted that the world economy is likely to shrink by 3% this year, but that even was a huge, op hugely optimistic at, uh, prediction because that, as the report itself uh, admitted, that projection was uh, based on the assumption that the pandemic is brought under control in the second half of, half of the year, and we have no sign of that happening. Probably the world economy will uh, uh, shrink by 5 6% this year. Unemployment is soaring. I mean, uh, many European countries, partly because kind of, uh, <coughs> governments, uh, uh, their governments are uh, being more willing to uh, prop up employment by paying forms are uh, implement subsidies, what is uh, known as job retention scheme in this uh, country. Unemployment is lower, but in the United States, of course, uh, official unemployment is at uh, like 15, 16%, but if you count the people, number of people who have become newly unemployed, counted by this uh, that you kind of unemployment insurance claimants, basically American unemployment rate is 
nearly 30 percent i mean i cannot go into the numbers but uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it uh, if you are interested you know during the great depression the only other economic crisis comparable in scale uh, to today's one the highest unemployment rate in the u.s was uh in 1933 and it was uh 25 percent so we are talking about a huge crisis and uh, this crisis has been in many ways that uh, well i mean uh, let's put it uh, this way i mean uh, let's not pull our punches it's uh, been all encompassing because uh, in other crises uh, usually there's one bit of the economy that goes wrong i don't know oil price goes up housing bubble collapses and so on but this time around it's uh, everything is about you know, demand is about production is about the financial market is about global supply chain and as a result uh, the kind of uh, the changes that we had to make are uh, the kind of policies that governments have introduced to deal with this uh, have been very very the, the, the different and comprehensive compared to previous comparable crises. So let me first uh, talk about a few changes that this uh, crisis has brought about. Now these changes, their consequences and what countries do in the order to deal with them will depend on how long this uh, crisis continues and uh, how effective uh, the solution to it uh, are likely to be. These are things that I don't have the expertise to predict, you know, the, the when is the vaccine coming out, are there going to be effective uh, cure, if not the, the vaccine uh, to deal with this uh, disease. And also that uh, the indeed that uh, is there going to be another similar outbreak you know all of these things are beyond my computer so um, i'm just uh, kind of uh, talking about this assuming that this crisis will probably last another two three maybe five years of course that that a lot of societies will uh, try to go back to the pre-pandemic way as much as possible but i think that uh, if we are going to be, even if we that, that wanted, uh, able to go back to the old ways, uh, that it will take a few years. Anyway, uh, so first of all, that this uh, the crisis, as I mentioned briefly uh, earlier, has affected the way we produce things. You know, the, the face-to-face services have been mm -hmm. devastated. restaurants, theaters, international tourism, things that, that uh, require close proximity of the provider and the customer is uh, that uh, been hit very, very hard. And yes, uh, the, the, Different societies are trying to deal with this in different ways. You know, you you uh, see these uh, the pictures of Asian restaurants that uh, have uh, the kind of uh, put the tapes uh, on the, the tables uh, the, the in restaurants, you know, shields and all kinds of things are being introduced. But that uh, I think uh, what is clear is that uh, these services will not recover the previous levels anytime soon. This means that, uh, I mean, of course, uh, there's a general fall in demand, so the, the level of activities in every sector is lower, but uh, this means that in relative terms, sectors that produce material goods are likely to expand, uh, partly because it's uh, easier to maintain the, the, the level of uh, production in those sectors, but also because when people do not uh, spend money on these face-to-face uh, -face services, 
they will that uh, spend money on other things. You know, there's already sign that uh, the demand for electronics goods that uh, is rising. So I think uh, there'll be a shift uh, from services to manufacturing and agriculture in the coming years. But also within manufacturing, there are some sectors where the method of production will have to be changed. You know, labor intensive industries processing in the US, in Germany, wheat processing factories have been sources of uh, the, the, the working environment is such that people work uh, in crop cross uh, proximity, they have to shout a lot because the uh, environment is uh, noisy and you know that these uh, become uh, the hotbed of uh, the spread of uh, infection so you know that they'll also need to uh, restructure their uh, production. There are concerns that the global value chains that uh, have been uh, built uh, in the last uh, few decades of globalization have become uh, too concentrated. So if uh, something goes wrong in the one place, the whole chain is affected. I mean, this is in the form of you know, the earthquakes in Taiwan and Japan affecting some company which supplies, uh, I don't know, 70% of the world uh, Obscure chemical, but very valuable chemical that are used in the manufacture of uh, microchips or mobile phones and so on. So that uh, you know, it was already happening, but uh, now a lot of people are saying that uh, wow, we need to uh, do something about it. I think uh, it's a fantasy, as some people discuss, uh, that to reshore or bring back home uh, the, the bulk of uh, manufacturing that have migrated uh, to China and other developing countries. I mean, it just uh, cannot be done. But, you know, I think that uh, people are already thinking about ways to diversify the sources of procurement and, and production so that, you know, one part of the system goes wrong, the other part uh, is uh, the uh, able to cope. Also, another uh, important change that uh, has been that some of the kind of uh, key tenets of neoliberalism have been undermined by this uh, crisis. You know, first of all, you know, this view that the less state there is, the better it is, has uh, the been totally exposed as countries that have uh, uh, had their government intervening early to test, trace, and isolate uh, the infected people, such as South Korea, New Zealand, Denmark, Vietnam. They have uh, minimized the spread of disease. You know, in Vietnam, officially the death toll from COVID-19 is zero. I mean, uh, even if you don't believe that particular number is very, very low. In contrast, the UK, the US, Brazil, countries that have uh, that refused to uh, take uh, the quick public action, you know, that uh, trying to believe that uh, the uh, greater economic freedom that uh, there is, uh, the better it is. They have uh, had to, you know, go into severe lockdown and despite that have produced a huge number of uh, uh, infected people and death. You know, I mean, when the, these numbers keep climbing, they just uh, become statistics, but I just don't understand how in the UK, in the US, in Brazil, people think it is uh, okay to have hundreds of people die every day, if not thousands. You know, the, I, I said the uh, death toll was zero in Vietnam, in South Korea, it's, uh, the, despite it being one of the 
countries that got it the earliest, the death toll is uh, still below 300. You know, in the UK, that 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 even now, I mean, uh, there are days uh, when that, that that number of people die in a day. You know, so the, it has uh, the exposed the total failure of this uh, uh, less fair approach when it comes to issues like this. Also, what countries have done to deal with this uh, crisis uh, in the at least short to medium term, but if not in the long term, have basically totally destroyed this uh, neoliberal kind of uh, the article of faith that the best thing that the government can do is to provide law and order and invest in the, the social infrastructure and maybe a bit of uh, basic education. And now the UK government is that, that uh, through this uh, follow scheme, paying 80% of salaries of uh, that, uh, millions of workers, although this is uh, supposed to wind down the, over time, you know, the German government, that government which is uh, so famous for fiscal conservatism, basically abolished this uh, law that uh, put the, the ceiling on public debt because that, uh, the German government realized that they just uh, cannot manage this uh, the, in compliance of that law. You know, the many governments are you know subsidizing and uh, the lending at the subsidized interest rate. Uh, the many many the companies, some governments are talking about. Uh, issuing government bond with a uh, negative interest rate, you know, every conventional wisdom in the neoliberal playbook has been uh, uh, destroyed. Thirdly, and that, uh, probably a bit uh, more, uh, uh, even more importantly, uh, this crisis has uh, made us think uh, what is that uh, really important, you know, the, in the neoliberal system of thinking, there is, I mean, that question doesn't even exist, you know, because that, uh, in that, 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 that system of thinking, so, uh, something's value is basically determined by the market. You know? I mean, this has been one of the key tips of the market economy. I mean, they have argued that there is no ethical system that can tell you what is more important, what is less important, you know, all these ideas about, you know, the productive and unproductive labor that the classical and the Marxist economies have struggled with, you know, these are all nonsenses. Yeah? If someone is uh, that, uh, valuable, the, the market will make it sure that that person gets uh, paid better. Yeah? And uh, when the progressive uh, the economists that uh, try to argue that there are some services that are essential, that are part of human rights, you know, market economists uh, poo poo the idea. But now, I mean, the, the UK government is talking about key workers, you know, the American government is talking about essential employees. And most of them are people who, in the market paradigm, were not very valuable people because uh, these were. People like, uh, well, doc medical doctors are the uh, exception here, but, uh, the, you know, uh, nurses, you know, care home workers, you know, people working in supermarkets, delivery people, you know, people who have uh, that worked at very low wages and therefore, according to the logic of market economics, uh, that, that who are not very valuable uh, for uh, society. But uh, now we realize that without these people, the society cannot be sustained. We have also realized more broadly the importance of uh, care work yeah? and uh, unpaid care work and child care, household management, mostly done by women. These have been I mean, literally valued at zero because uh, the, the, uh, it's uh, not marketed. Now we realize that uh, without these, uh, the uh, care economy, reproductive sector, whatever you may call it, 
society cannot even exist. Yeah? And finally, I think uh, that this uh, crisis has uh, made us realize that we about in common day. I mean, the, the, a pandemic like this basically has uh, told us that unless everyone is safe, no one is safe. You know, I mean, uh, in the U.S., uh, for example, because it has very weak welfare state and uh, weak uh, labor rights, you know, the, a lot of workers basically couldn't take a sick leave if they were ill, because if they don't work, they don't get paid. You know? And then these people had to go out and make a thing, and then they were contributing to the spread of the disease. And when something like this happens, you know, it's not like, I don't know, some fancy cancer drug uh, the, which are very expensive and only rich people can buy and perhaps uh, survive the cancer, everyone else dies. I mean, uh, this kind of less 80-90% of the population is vaccinated. You cannot, even if you are most powerful, the richest people, you cannot uh, avoid this thing. And I think that also the, the taking the collective action to slow down the spread of disease, which has uh, made uh, very important differences, and also in the process realizing that if we all kind of uh, reduce our activities, you know, cities like New Delhi, that, that which have never seen really clear sky for many years that, that uh, can have uh, the blue sky, you know, that uh, all of this have also made people realize uh, that uh, we should uh, and could do a lot more to fight climate change. I think uh, that there have been these uh, big shifts, you know, the necessary readjustment of the product, production system, undermining of uh, neoliberal technologies, making people rethink really what is more important in our life, and, and uh, the realization that we are all bound in a common destiny. I mean, these things are going to fundamentally influence the way that uh, we design new society after this uh, crisis. Also, at the, uh, I'll, I'll be a bit brief on this aspect, at the global level, I think uh, that this has been quite an interesting uh, the experience because, you know, when you, when you look at how different countries have this crisis, you know, you see that actually for once that, that there's no clear relationship between a country's level of uh, income and how they have managed this. You know, I just uh, told you about uh, Vietnam, you know. I mean, a country whose uh, per capita income is uh, like not even 5% uh, that of uh, the United States. I mean, it has uh, the completely controlled the disease. And, and uh, the US, the UK countries that used to lecture other countries on how to run their society, what kind of values they should uphold, how to manage the government. I mean, they have uh, been shown to be in complete disarray. And I think that, that this that, that, that will be a the opportunity where actually a lot of developing country people overcome this uh, inferiority complex that uh, imperialism, colonialism, and racism have uh, the ingrained in many people's minds uh, over the last uh, few centuries. You know so-called superior societies have seen tens of thousands of deaths, you know, Vietnam, Kerala, in India, Ethiopia, I mean, countries uh, who are very, very poor, or rather societies, they have uh, managed to contain this disease. 
you know, uh, this is that uh, uh, going to change the way developing country people perceive the so-called advanced country. What are so advanced about them? Yeah, when they are willing to, you know, let tens of thousands of people die so that I don't know the pubs that uh, can make more money. You know. Anyway, so the how do we rebuild the uh, society? I mean, I, uh, a lot of answers. Well, my answers uh, that, that uh, to that question have already been contained in my analysis of the crisis itself. But first of all, see all about a common destiny, and there's a much more kind of demand uh, for much greater demand for more solidaristic way of uh, managing society. I mean, uh, partly coincidentally, that we've also seen the rise of uh, anti-racist uh, movements uh, in the U.S. and uh, around the world. So I think uh, that we should uh, use this as an occasion to push for more uh, economy. So establishing in countries that don't have it, but also strengthening the universal welfare state that uh, we have in some countries. You think this as an occasion to push further for climate change actions, using this uh, as an occasion to, you know, push back uh, these uh, reactionary racist uh, forces. I think uh, the, that kind of, uh, the, sorry, those kind of things that uh, are now that, uh, in many people's mind. I mean, uh, perhaps uh, the, a lot of people thought those are, I mean, uh, yeah, ideally the things that we want to have, but that we cannot, but now we know that we can. and. Indeed, if you look at uh, different countries, uh, countries that have uh, taken a more solidaristic approach uh, to this uh, pandemic are the ones that have uh, done better. And then that, that uh, we will need to rethink uh, our priorities. I mean, not just at the individual level, but at the social level, you know, the, in Britain, we had this uh, weird Thursday evenings for a while when the, the we clapped uh, for the NHS workers while the government was not willing to pay even a single more penny to them. You know, that kind of thing has to change. I mean, that we need to have the confidence to say that, yes, uh, there are things that are more fundamental, that are more important, that are not necessarily going to be rewarded uh, by the market. And if the market wouldn't reward it, the society has to find a way to make uh, that uh, people working in those things that are more rewarded, yeah? including uh, the people who do unpaid uh, care work at home. We need to rethink uh, the work-life balance that we have uh, that, uh, started to Kind of rethink uh, as an experience of uh, the, the kind of long periods of uh, the working from home for many people. And having seen the pandemic, uh, the, the, which a lot of scientists say is in a way an inevitable consequence of human encroachment in nature, we need to rethink our balance with nature, part of which is that, that you know, that basically that, that due to unequal nature of many of our societies, you know. I mean, there are a lot of countries where you have these uh, farmers doing, you know, slash and burn and uh, kind of encroaching into nature when there are 
yellow lands uh, that are uh, owned by landlords. Yeah? So we need to uh, rethink all these uh, priorities. And finally, we will have to you know, rethink the production system, the global supply chain, partly because of uh, this uh, uh, pandemic, but uh, you know, the, no one thinks that, that this will be the only disease that is going to hit human society. A lot of us uh, agree that increasing acceleration of climate change will uh, create uh, many other crises. I mean, uh, uh, maybe not pandemic, but uh, in other forms, yeah? extreme weather events and so on. That, uh, who knows uh, what other crises are in store. So we need to you know, to rebuild the system to have more, if you like, resilience and robustness because uh, that, that, uh, just uh, think about the uh, uh, airplanes, oil tankers, you know, because uh, the, the, they uh, can uh, produce disastrous outcomes if uh, something doesn't work. All these systems, including that also things like electricity, grid, they have ways to absorb shock, isolate, it, uh, isolate shocks, and quickly uh, bring backups and so on. And uh, the economy will uh, also have to be redesigned in that kind of way. So to summarize uh, three things, one is, you know, approach to economy and society, including the expansion of the universal welfare state and uh, inclusion of the so-called care economy in our thinking. Second, uh, <clears throat> rethinking our priorities. And thirdly, restructuring and redesigning the economic system so they can be more robust and resilient. Thank you very much. Uh, I cannot hear you, Young. I cannot hear oh, you. Oh, sorry. My, my mic yeah. was muted. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, it was very, very insightful. Um, now it's the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat. Um, we've already collated around 10 mm -hmm. questions as well. So we'll start asking them. Um, just yeah. to, for the people who joined midway, I will re-link uh, the Facebook and Twitter links as well and the past events. Okay, so the first question that we had was from Malik. Um, the question was, the paradigm shift is globally expected post-COVID-19 economic and social crisis. Um, how do you think the community will likely tackle the generic societal issues and do you expect universal standards of international humanitarian laws uh, to be likely revisited? Mm. Wow, um, <laughs> this is at, uh, a bit beyond me. Uh, yeah, but I, I think uh, now we know that uh, the whole community is bound in common destiny. You know? I mean, it always has been, but uh, the, you know, the, the, we, we now feel it more acutely and uh, there'll be demands at, uh, for kind of uh, greater respect uh, even for marginalized groups and so on. And yeah, the, that will uh, create the uh, further pressure towards kind of uh, the more emphasis on universal human rights and so on. However, but, uh, whether that actually gets translated into uh, laws and international conventions and so on, I mean, it's uh, going to be a long struggle, but, you know, I mean, to be a bit kind of forthright, uh, you know, I, I believe that in the long run, uh, humanity 
progress is. We have seen many setbacks uh, recently, you know, the Trump, Bolsonaro, Brexit, what have you. But, you know, 200 years ago, the, a lot of people, especially in the Americas, uh, thought it was perfectly okay to buy and sell people. You know, 100 years ago, Britain and many other countries put women in prison for asking for vote. You know, only 70, 80 years ago, you know, the founding fathers of uh, today's uh, developing nations, you know, Nkrumah, Kenyatta, I mean, these people were all hunted down by the British and the French as the terrorists. You know, 40 years ago, Margaret Thatcher famously said that anyone who thinks that there'll be a black majority rule in South Africa ever is uh, living in a cloud cuckoo land. Yeah? But all these things have been achieved, not by law, but because people organize and uh, fought for them. And I think that, uh, yeah, in the long run, this uh, the crisis might be an occasion for those movements uh, to be more, uh, the, if you like, galvanized and become more international and so on and uh, have a greater chance of success. I think I'll leave it at that. I'm not an expert on this issue. Yeah. OK. Um, the second question was by Eleanor. Uh, the question is, the prolif mm. proliferation of misinformation on a global scale is arguably a reflection of widespread mistrust in both national and international institutions and systems. Uh, what do you think are the longer term ramifications of the mistrust? Yeah, well, this has been the most uh, corrosive consequence of the recent rise of uh, the, the right, the extreme right. But, you know, I think uh, my attitude is that we, despite all this mistrust, we have to invest in rebuilding trust in these uh, institutions. Maybe some of the existing institutions have become so discredited, they need to be scrapped. I'm not against it. Maybe that, 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 that some can be redeemed. But also we could uh, that try to create that uh, kind of global public information service. Yeah? I mean, something that I mean, that sounds overly idealistic, but, you know, something that, that, that we need because the biggest gainers from the erosion of uh, public trust in these uh, the public institutions is uh, that those who control the media with their money. Yeah? Because then, that, that if uh, that, that citizens uh, do not have, I don't know, whatever, that uh, UN information service or the, the, you know, some global charity that uh, uh, provides fact checks and so on, uh, unless that uh, people have these uh, trusty sources, you know, that they'll begin to be uh, whatever that uh, give them. You know? And uh, those who control the media, including things like Facebook and so on, uh, through their money, will basically uh, be in a position to manipulate them to their benefit. So I think uh, that despite uh, people's misgivings about you know, building yet another international organization that are uh, trying to restore trust in the public institutions that have uh, already been eroded and dilapidated, I think uh, that's the only way out because otherwise, you know, it uh, becomes uh, free for all and uh, free for all basically means for those uh, people with money. You know? Okay. Um, talking about people with money and the inequalities, and this is actually a question that I wanted to ask. Um, it was a question by mm. Tina. It's, question is, the uh, pandemic brought to light and exacerbated grave structural inequalities in various societies. Oftentimes it takes a crisis to move um, reforms forward. What major interventions mm. do you hope to see in de both developed and developing countries? 
Yeah, no, that's a very good. Yeah, I mean the pandemic has uh, revealed that you know poorer people, people in marginalized communities, are more prone to contract the disease and die from it because of you know generally worse health, uh, the, the limited access to healthcare, and uh, other things that uh, define uh, this uh, unequal society. I think that, uh, you know, the positive, uh, a positive way to respond to this is to accept that and uh, find a way to reduce that inequality. And it is already happening in some countries. You know? I mean, I'm not usually a cheerleader for my own country, South Korea. You know, we have so many shameful world records, you know, the highest suicide rate, the lowest fertility rate, you know, I mean, name it. But uh, South Korea has uh, that this time around managed the pandemic really well. First of all, because it, uh, the, despite this uh, general aversion to uh, the welfare state, it uh, has a very robust public health insurance. Yeah? So anyone who had the, the, the problems uh, could just uh, go and get tested and uh, treated. You know, this is how you, know, mm. that, uh, you manage to keep the death toll under 300. Yeah? But uh, in that country, a crucial weakness uh, was uh, exposed by this uh, pandemic because you know because it uh, controlled the health situation so well, it uh, actually didn't go into full lockdown. Yeah? But still, people are wary of going out, yeah? and the biggest uh, the sufferers uh, from this uh, was uh, these uh, uh, people who are running small bars restaurants, karaoke bars. These are people you've seen in the famous Korean movie, The Parasite. Yeah? I mean, people who try to eke a living out of a chicken, fried chicken joint, fail, save up a bit more money by working as a, a, a substitute drivers and then set up another thing, cake shop, and then it goes bankrupt again and that, that you end up in semi-basement apartment folding pizza boxes. Yeah? So these people were very hard hit and now the, the country is actually, I was actually quite surprised uh, talking about introducing universal employment insurance scheme. Yeah? So basically it doesn't matter what your job used to be. I mean at the moment, unless you work for a decent sized company and have worked uh, for them I forget that the exact uh, the entitlement period, three months, six months, uh, you don't get the unemployment insurance. Yeah? Now, having seen this uh, that, uh, problem, the country is now talking about introducing unemployment insurance that covers people who work in any type of company, self-employed people, you know, the, the so-called platform workers, you know, the people working in the gig economy. So yeah, I mean, uh, if it happens, it will be a really progressive uh, change. And I think, yeah, I mean, that, that is uh, the up to uh, societies, up to especially the citizens to demand these things, uh, that to uh, that create the systems that will, yeah, not only enable the country to deal with uh, this kind of crisis in the future, but also more importantly, that, that become, uh, make the society more equal. Mm -hmm. Now, so that uh, my my point is that we have to start the discussion. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, the, we, we have to the, talk about this. Yeah, I mean, that the people have, have to keep banging on. Why did you keep all those uh, claps? Yeah, during those eight weeks uh, in the spring uh, to the nurses, but then you didn't uh, pay them anymore. Yeah. I mean, uh, why is the NHS so kind of uh, dilapidated? Yeah, I mean, we have to keep pushing for this. Otherwise, uh, the uh, people in power are not going to do that. Yeah?
Okay. Um, so following on from the um, the like the employment scheme that Sakura is doing. So being a Korean myself, I was, I was also quite surprised by how well South Korea has done and their reactions to it. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right, but a question by Yotisha Yosh um, is that it has been posted that in many countries, the universal basic income scheme will be implemented. So will it be enough in order to regain the economic damages that have been suffered? Uh, well, universal basic income, I am not a fan of it. Uh, you know, first of all, a lot depends on how you do it. You know, do not forget that Milton Friedman and Friedrich von Hayek were supporters of uh, the universal basic income. Yeah? So basically, these are people who say, yeah, the, give everyone, I don't know, the, the 9,000 pounds or whatever, and they can do whatever. I mean, with that money, they wouldn't starve to death, but everything above that is uh, the, not the society's problem. Yeah? I mean, if it's that kind of universal basic income, which is actually the kind of basic income supported by some of the Silicon Valley billionaires, I'm 200% against it. If it is uh, the, the more progressive form, I still have a problem because, you know, having income is one thing, but also that you need uh, affordable, high quality services, yeah? I mean, unfortunately, the supporters of uh, universal basic income do not address this uh, aspect uh, uh, very clearly. You know, okay, so the, the, you you convert all the say the welfare entitlement yeah, that uh, you get in uh, Britain. Yeah? So the notional entitlement to your NHS service, you know, notional entitlement uh, to your Unemployment benefit, yeah, the, the amount of uh, child fit housing benefit, convert them all into cash and give it to you. And then how are people going to buy this? I mean, is the government then going to wash off his hands and say, now you can go into the private market and buy it? I think uh, that will be a disaster. Eh? Because that, that, that many of these services are of basically provided uh, by the government, which is not seeking profit. I mean, of course, a lot of it uh, has that, uh, become privatized that, uh, by stealth, but at least in theory, you know, the, these uh, the, the NHS and other bodies that provide these uh, social services, they are not out to make money. And also that the, they pull the uh, customers and uh, can get uh, big discounts, uh, there's a uh, scale economy provision. So instead of single hospitals going to a pharmaceutical company saying we want to buy diabetes drugs for 5,000 people, the NHS can go to these companies and say we want uh, diabetes, diabetes uh, drugs at, uh, for the, the 17 million people. I mean, the count, kind of discount that you get, I mean, it's a uh, totally different planet. Yeah? So that the unless that uh, you preserve this uh, the public provision, these services are going to be very expensive. So actually, even when you give them the same amount of money, they will be able to buy less. Yeah? I and mean, this is what's happening in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. spends 17% of GDP on healthcare compared to 8-12% in other advanced countries, and it has the worst was the health uh, record in the rich world. I mean, part of it is, of course, uh, because of uh, greater inequality, but uh, a lot of it is because, you know, the treatments are expensive. Yeah? I mean, the uh, COVID-19 test, uh, which uh, you can get for free in South Korea, in some American the, 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 the communities, you have had to pay $3,000 to get that test. Yeah? So, I don't know, I mean, uh, I cannot go into that, uh, any more detail, but uh, when it comes to basic income, please uh, do not just look at the uh, demand side, but also look at the supply side. Yeah? I mean, okay, that uh, whatever amount of income they are going to give you, but then how are they going to provide those uh, the, the basic social services? Some 
proposals uh, are progressive, but some are not, some haven't even thought about this. Yeah? So you need to look at the, the, the both aspects. Okay, thank you. So the next question was by Cassie. I'm sorry that I skipped it. Um, the question is, do you think that this is an opportunity for society to change the way it operates? Um, if so, how? Uh, if not, do you think that, uh, oh, so uh, if not, who do you think are going to be the main losers? What type of companies might we see disappear? Yeah, I've already kind of uh, indirectly answered uh, many of these uh, the questions by Cassie. That, that thank you for your question, Cassie. Uh, yes, that uh, I think you know, opportunity is literally what it is called an opportunity. Yeah? Even if uh, there's an opportunity, if you don't make something out of it, is that uh, not going to produce anything by itself? Yeah? So I think that uh, it's uh, very important uh, for citizens uh, to demand, organize, talk about it. Yeah, I mean the, how we want to change the society. You know, having seen that actually we don't all need to be in the office uh, to be to become uh, efficient workers. Can we change the way we organize work? You know, that, that can we work more often uh, from home if uh, not completely? Yeah. I mean, can we, in that way, uh, reduce uh, the, the greenhouse gas because fewer uh, people will be commuting? You know, a lot of these things uh, that need to be discussed. Uh, but as I say, I mean, unless we make demands uh, that that uh, voice our concerns, uh, it's not going to happen. Now, in terms of uh, different industries, yes, I mean, the biggest uh, losers will be those involved, but, uh, that involve face-to-face uh, -face services. Yeah, so this will be a huge problem for many developing countries, especially because a lot of developing countries rely heavily on tourism. Now that's going to be dead uh, for a few years. Also in developing countries, we have this uh, the huge informal sector, many of which involve face-to-face uh, -face services. So when the, the, these people do not have customers, how are they going to cope? Uh, so in terms of the industry mix, I think uh, it will depend on the country, but broadly speaking, this will uh, negatively affect poorer developing countries with uh, big service sector, especially informal sector, and countries like the US and the UK, which uh, rely a lot on services, and countries that uh, have uh, greater strength in manufacturing and other material production are going to be relatively better off. So that's my prediction. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for maybe three or four more questions. Mm -hmm. So I want to skip to one of them by Simon. So Simon's question is, you mentioned that this crisis has revealed the shortcomings of market fundamentalism and that mm -hmm. the state is likely to increase, uh, increasingly intervene in and steer markets in the future. His question is, do you think MMT or Keynesian economic policies uh, will dominate in the post-corona years to come? Uh, well, I'm not Oh, macroeconomists, but yes, I mean, the, the, those kind of macroeconomic thinking will uh, become more influential. I wouldn't say dominant because, uh, you know, the current macroeconomic uh, approach, uh, the, a weird mixture of, you know, fiscal conservatism and monetary the abandon, you know, it is uh, the dominant because it uh, serves uh, the the powerful interest. So I don't know whether you know the rise of uh, Keynesianism, modern monetary theory, which is uh, that, that certain, will be sufficient to replace uh, the existing orthodoxy. But it's not just uh, in terms of macroeconomic policy I mentioned that is uh, going to see change. I mean, we are going to see you know, big changes in the way that uh, we. You know, the <clears throat> manage uh, the welfare state, which has implications for taxation policies. Yeah. We are going to the, the, the see big changes in the structure of 
production, which will have ramifications for industrial policy and trade policy. So yeah, it'll be in all kinds of areas. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, it will also spill into our approach to fighting climate change. So, you know, that, that it's not going to be just a macroeconomic area that uh, the conventional wisdom and prevailing orthodoxy are being hit. It's uh, across all areas, you know, reflecting partly the all encompassing nature of this crisis. So I would uh, say that there will be significant changes, but once again, I mean, that uh, whether an economic theory becomes uh, dominant or at least uh, widely accepted is in big part a political question. So a lot will depend on how things are fought and, and uh, how the, the, the political elite uh, respond to this. Mm. Yeah, I think Hansel had a very similar question as well, because her question was about how do you think the capitalism might change in the future and how people might um, react to capitalism? Mm. Well, yeah, I think it's not how it will change, but how we have to change it, you yeah? know? Because, I mean, given the existing distribution of wealth, income, and power, unless uh, the ordinary citizens, uh, the progressive people get organized and push the governments, they are not going to change that, that things automatically. Eh? We've seen that uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah? So the, for about uh, like nine months, uh, they embraced that uh, uh, Keynes. Yeah? and then the, the bailed out banks and so on, and the, the, they were going to reform the financial system. You know, after two years, uh, the, it uh, was more or less uh, back to the old game. Yeah? And then things got even worse because uh, the, in some countries like the US and the UK, you know, the right-wing governments were elected, and then they, you know, in the US, uh, basically Donald Trump, uh, the, invalidated many of the reforms that uh, were introduced to the financial market of the Obama after the crisis. So, you know, if uh, that we just uh, don't keep fighting, I mean, it's uh, that, uh, not going to change. So yes, I mean, uh, there are new opportunities, you know, new solidarities emerging, you know, new ways of thinking, but you know, how they all will gel together and that, uh, that, that, translate into collective action, public policies, institutional changes, that's, you know, I mean, in a way, that are up to us, everyone, yeah? Okay, I think uh, the last two questions, I think I'm going to put mm. together, and um, it's by Marie and Francis. So Marie's question was, you've spoken about the vulnerabilities and change mm. of global value chains. Do you mm. think we will see a shift in mainstream theory and praxis from a uh, global free trade? Um, yeah. Francis's question was again on developing countries being locked into a primary uh, commodity trap for a long time. Mm -hmm. And how do you think the pandemic will offer uh, whether a way out or a slightly different change? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's uh, start with uh, primary commodities. Yes, uh, of course, uh, a lot of developing countries are dependent on primary commodities, and especially those that are dependent on oil have been devastated because uh, oil demand has uh, collapsed as a result of pandemic. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, that kind of episode shows that uh, how it is important for developing countries to diversify, well, I mean, to a reasonable point, uh, the uh, uh, production structure to you know, the, avoid this kind of Easier said than done. I mean, uh, Ecuador under Rafael Correa tried for about 10 years uh, to shift the production structure. The pool of the oil was so strong uh, that uh, by the end of his term, it that, uh, was uh, a bit lower, but the dependence was uh, still very high. Now, 
in the next few years, uh, the, because of the pandemic, you know, primary commodities, be material products, might actually become more important in relative terms. Yeah, as I keep saying, the overall level of demand will be lower. So I'm not saying that countries that produce manufacturing or the, the primary commodity will uh, be able to sell more uh, in general, but you know, in relative terms at least, uh, primary commodities are going to fare better than the services. Yeah? Now the point once again is that uh, you know, that itself is going to be a short relief. Yeah? I mean, what happens in the long run will really depend on what you do with the income that you earn from primary commodity. And yeah, uh, uh, luckily, a lot of countries have been thinking about uh, industrializing, uh, using more active industrial policy and so on. So something might uh, uh, happen in some countries. And yeah, some countries are already doing some very impressive things, you know, and, uh, Ethiopia has uh, the, the converted a lot of its uh, garment-making facilities, basically investments from East Asia, South Korea, China, Taiwan, uh, into factories uh, producing uh, personal protection equipment uh, for the medical staff, you know. It has uh, the converted its uh, passenger jet uh, planes into uh, cargo planes and uh, is uh, doing more cargo business. So, yeah, I mean, the even relatively poor country, can that, that, that make uh, this uh, as an opportunity to upgrade this economy. So yeah, I just hope that uh, countries, okay, I know that, that, that the current situation is so difficult. I mean, it's uh, difficult to think about the future, but you know, they really need to think you know, that, that what they can do, you know, if uh, you have been reliant on tourism, Heavily. I mean, okay, I mean, if you're a Caribbean island state, there might be very little that you can do, but uh, if you are some country, yeah, then that, uh, you will have to, A, think about ways to uh, make uh, tourism safer in whatever way, but uh, B, more importantly, you need to find a way to get out of uh, tourism and uh, uh, start doing something else. Now, that, uh, finally, linking that into the we organization of the global value chain. Uh, yeah, I think there is a widespread recognition that uh, this uh, the requires uh, the we organization of global value chains. But you know, uh, first of all, in in the many cases, unless this uh, the, the crisis really persists uh, for three, four, five years. I mean, uh, as soon as uh, things become okay, people will just say, well, that, uh, let's forget about it, yeah? because that, uh, reorganizing the value chain requires uh, investment, yeah? uh, hard work. Let's just uh, that, that go back to the old ways. Yeah? So uh, it's not certain that uh, that kind of organization will happen. And even if it happens, it will happen only in uh, limited, areas, yeah, because even if uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, wants to bring all the uh, ma lost uh, manufacturing production in what it considers key sectors uh, back home, they cannot do it. Yeah? I mean, they don't have the supply network. They don't have the correct uh, infrastructure. They don't have the, the, the necessary the supply of technicians. Yeah? I mean, even if it wanted, Apple cannot bring factories in China to California to make uh, the mobile phones. Yeah? So, you know, the, the, there'll be only a limited uh, degree of uh, reorganization. But yes, I mean, in the long run, the, the countries and industries that do it uh, in a more the, the sustainable way, making uh, the network uh, more robust, uh, more dispersed, yeah? more resilient, will reap the benefit, but uh, the, let's not underestimate the kind of uh, seduction of uh, immediate gains, you know. So 
uh, I think uh, that despite all this level uh, the, the final reorganization will be rather limited. I'm not saying they shouldn't be done, but uh, the, my guess is it will be done in a limited way because uh, every time there's some disaster, when there was the famous uh, Fukushima, you know, the earthquake, the uh, problem with the nuclear reactor, you know, there were some sectors that so basically the end of uh, the supply for raw materials, uh, the, sorry, intermediate materials, because there was one Japanese company that was supplying 70% of the world and that kind of thing. Every time that happens, like uh, the earthquake in Taiwan the, the several years before, everyone says, oh yeah, we have to uh, change the supply chain, the, the, the make it less concentrated, you know, less complicated. And then, you know, two years later, we are back to square one. So I'm not too sure the, how much change will happen to the global value chains, but Yes, I think uh, the taste for uh, global free trade be diminished somewhat, but you know, I think uh, on that we should really change the conversation because that uh, you know that uh, we, especially those who are concerned with uh, the fate of developing countries like uh, the people that saw us, you know, we need to talk about the. the you know, the international trade in a completely different way. I mean, it's not just a simple dichotomous problem of free trade versus uh, protectionism. You know, there are many different ways of organizing international trade. You know, there are many ways of uh, regulating trade. Protectionism is uh, only one way. You know, we do it with uh, the foreign direct investment. We do it with uh, the government procurement programs, we do it with uh, the, in the case of the U.S. Uh, defense policy, so you know, uh, the, we, we need to the, change the conversation in a more uh, nuanced way, but uh, I do not have time to talk about that at this point. Thank you. I cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, sir. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, um, I think that's the end. Uh, thank you for the talk. So that concludes the Q&A and the talk. Um, just before we go, I know we've overran by quite a bit, but if you are to summarize your um, talk about what COVID is going to be like after, co uh, sorry, what the economy is going to be like after mm -hmm. COVID in maybe 30 seconds, um, how would you do it? Oh, no, we have to work to make it what we want. I mean, that, that it's not going to automatically happen, but yeah, in an ideal world, uh, we want uh, greater <laughs> social protection, greater recognition of the importance of the uh, care economy, yeah? restructuring of uh, the, our production and supply networks uh, into something more dispersed, uh, resilient and robust. But, you know, whether these mm. things are necessarily going to happen, I mean, this is my wish list, but, you know, <laughs> it's that, uh, the upon all of us, everyone, to mm. demand another world and fight for it. Eh? Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, before we leave, I would like to just do one last advertising of our Facebook and Twitter. Um, I've just posted in the chat. And also the webinar series will carry on. So there is one next week on Monday. Um, that's by our very own SOAS um, people, by Basani Balioy and Gilad Isaac. And that's going to be on the perspectives of COVID from South Africa's view. Um, thank you all very much. And thank you to Hajin Chang for doing the talk. And thank you for SOAS and the Open Economics Forum for organizing this as well. Thank you. Thank you.